good afternoon, everybody. Um, I have a hard act to follow after that keynote address. Um, thank you guys for all joining and uh, being here. Designing for readers. So we're going to talk today about, um, how, am I too close to the, this way? Is that, is that better? Um, so we're going to talk today about how reader research <laughs> can uh, be used to help um, our design decisions in our products, in our magazines, um, whether it's websites, digital media. Mostly we're going to discuss print in this case, but I feel like these principles can work across all brands. Um, so, so who is this guy? Um, thank you for the great introduction. Um, my name is Matthew Bates. I, uh, I grew up in uh, the wonderful state of Oregon, um, back in the, in the Northwest. Um, I grew up in a small t a community called um, Bend, which is in the middle of the state. Back up, back up. <laughs> is that better? <laughs> All right. Um, where I was able to go canoeing and hiking and uh, skiing and had just a great upbringing. Um, but when I graduated from college, I wanted to do something more and I wanted to be part of the publishing industry. So where did I go? I went to New York. Um, where I was able to work for a variety of titles, um, some of which were mentioned, uh, Travel Leisure Golf, um, Sever, uh, This Old House, kind of all over. Um, I got to meet my wonderful wife who grew up there. And uh, so we were, work we were doing great there. Then I took a job at Backpacker Magazine as their art director. And uh, in 2007, um, this was 2003, in 2007, um, the magazine was sold. It had been part of Rodale Press, and it was sold to Active Interest Media. They said, we'd like you to be part of the magazine, but you have to move to Colorado. So we said, sure, that sounds good. <laughs> um, Active Interest Media um, has a number of brands that range from uh, national consumer titles like backpacker, climbing, ski, skiing, yoga journal, um, vegetarian times, as well as uh, smaller business to business type publications and websites um, such as the Outdoor Industries Snooze website. And um, we run uh, trade show dailies for uh, the Outdoor Industry um, OR, Outdoor Retailer Show in Salt Lake City twice a year, and um, the Ski Industry Association show in Denver each uh, winter. So we have a variety of different projects, um, like I said, from monthly magazines down to magazines that come out a couple times a year to uh, trade show dailies which we show up on site. We make a daily magazine for four days, and uh, then we're head home. So that gives us a, a wide variety of um, projects and experiences just within um, one company. Now, this is how a lot of people look when you mention reader research. <laughs> they, especially art directors, I've found. They're scared of it, or not necessarily scared of it, but they don't necessarily want it. They push it off a little bit. They don't want people, if, if, you, if you're like me, the first reaction is like, I don't want somebody telling me what to do. So um, we can get uh, a little uh, standoffish. We know our reader. We want to say we know our reader. So therefore, um, what, can, uh, what can this research say? Or it, we're, if you're like me sometimes, we're worried that it's going to give us the answers we don't necessarily want to hear. Why should we care? This is the other question. We need to care because our readers are everything to us. You know, that sounds cliche, but it's the truth. We, they're the ones that have the passion for the products that we're, um, we're supplying. They're the ones with the passion for the subject matter as much as we have it. Um, they're the ones that, uh, that identify with these products. Our magazines are not just um, something they get in the mail once a month or every other month. Um, our magazines are partially who they are. They, our readers identify with us through our brands. They, they see themselves in their subscriptions, in the magazines that they get, um, the, the magazines that they have on their, their counter um, and their desk, uh, their, you know, the, the living room uh, countertop. So these are the people that are driving what we, we create. Now, the other question is always, 
but if we have too many people, too many input, then we just have too many cooks in the kitchen and we end up with, you know, mess. And that's a valid concern. Like, we do have to go through reader research when it's in dealing with design in a very logical, methodical way. Because the fact is, is that sometimes too many cooks in the kitchen can um, create havoc. Not just in the overall design, but it can slow things down. We're all very busy. We all have a lot of projects that we're working on. Um, I, I don't think at any point in my career have I um, seen so many art directors pulled in so many ways on different products. We were talking about branding earlier today. And the number of different products and projects that people are working on um, is, is really staggering. And, you know, that, that's an amazing feat. So we have to be efficient. You know, we have to be creative, but we have to be efficient. We have to use our time in a, in a, in a managing way. And that means taking on the readers, you know, reader research and what our readers are telling us um, in a way that we can process it, we can act upon it, and then we can move on. So you're saying, but wait, how am I going to get the reader research that I need? I, I'm not like People Magazine, you know. T I don't have um, an entire marketing group to, to direct this. I can't test, you know, at certain points they've tested um, tens of covers just for one issue, you know. Uh, I, I think I counted at one point, that I was talking to somebody, they, they did 30 covers for, for one issue they tested in, on focus groups. That's, that's a lot, you know. And most of us, almost all of us, don't have that kind of research, and that's okay. We have, everybody does have resources. And it's stressful, let's be honest. You know, it's stressful enough for us to deal with creating something that um, has the business imperatives that the publisher wants, that has the content imperatives that the editor wants, um, and then we're trying to create something that connects to the reader on an emotional level, like we just were talking about. You add more people and it's a lot of stress. <laughs> So we have, to, we have to, again, think about this in a way that we can process and we can make a difference. Sometimes it feels like we're walking on a bit of a tightrope. You know, newsstand sales have never been more important when we're, when we're thinking about it. Not just because of what they mean to the bottom line, but let's be honest, a lot of us in this room are judged by how the newsstand sales are going. You know, there could be a lot of great things happening with your magazine, and if the newsstand sales aren't working, then we have to be accountable for that. And that can be a little bit of a scary proposition. What reader research does is it's that harness right there. It's what's helping us stay on that, that line and giving us the support that we need. You know, it gives us guidance. Now, there's an important thing, and I know that most of the people in this room are in the art discipline. There might be some editors or publishers as well, but um, the, the majority of us here, we are on the design side as either art directors or designers. Um, and one of the most important things that I can't stress enough uh, is we first need to get a seat at the table when this stuff is being discussed. We need to be involved in this at a very early stage Partially so we can be part of the conversation, so we can fully understand it. We don't want to be the person who's sitting at our desk and they hand us an already processed set of data and says, this is what you need to do. Because we have no chance of having input during that time. So what does that mean? It means we need to be communicating with the people who do decide who's at this table. We need to be showing the value that design has to the product, to the bottom line, you know? Being creative does connect to the bottom line. Great design connects to the bottom line. And when we're sitting there, when we're in these meetings and we have an opportunity to, to be part of the discussion about what is going to be asked of the readers, how are they gonna be discussed? What do we want to know from a design standpoint? I don't know, you know, the fact that if we're not in those discussions, some of the questions that we would like to have answered as art directors, as designers, as photo editors, could get left off the sheet. And that's really valuable information. So we need to communicate with the decision makers who are part of this and get it. We need to say, you know what, we need to be part of this. 
and that that could be that could be part of a discussion that could be part of a a long term situation that you might have to convince somebody but that is not uh, time lost that is that is time well spent all right readers so the number of magazines that are represented in here um, I'm not going to even try to guess. Then when you break it down to the types of subjects that are represented in here, I mean, just me standing up here, between the outdoor group and the home group, which are the two um, divisions of, uh, of active interest media that I oversee the art department for, we, ha we produce um, close to, a, actually just over 100 print editions a year. Um, that's uh, a staff of 10 and it represents depending on the year and the what projects uh, my boss decides we need to do um, somewhere between 15 and 20 titles ranging from backpacking uh, in the Rockies to um, a magazine called New Old House or Early Homes um, where you know people are building their dream homes to log home living, timber home living. We have a magazine called um, Country's Best Cabins. Um, the, the scope of readership in, this, in just that group alone is quite staggering from a demographic standpoint, from an interest standpoint. And all these people are, are extremely passionate about what they're, what they're getting. So we always have to be careful to lump in uh, information that we're gathering all into one. So some of the stuff that I'll be talking about, you know, it might hit you right in the chest and say, yep, that's exactly my magazine. Some of it might be a little more tangential and you, there's nobody that knows your product better than you do. There's nobody that knows your readers better than you do and has the opportunity to connect to your readers better than you do. So as we're going through this, I'm going to use a couple of magazines as case studies. Um, hopefully some things will connect um, for you and that uh, we can kind of use them as general guiding points. But always keep in mind that these things are, are flexible and that uh, are, are good to be general guides to ideas, but don't limit yourself to what you can think through on your own. So the first magazine, and it looks like it blew out up there at the top, uh, is Climbing. So Climbing is one of our uh, consumer brands that we have. It's a national magazine. I guess you can figure out what the subject matter is about. Um, we have a very passionate readership. Um, it's one of the leaders in its space uh, on the uh, climbing industry. and. Uh, this is what it looked like uh, a couple years ago. So we decided that it was time um, that it needed some help. It needed um, to be looked at and try to figure out w how we can connect to the readers better. So we did some reader surveys, um, what we call multivariance cover test studies. Uh, and basically, we put out a call for a reader panel. and. We've done this a number of times with different magazines where we put it out, we'll put it out through uh, Facebook, we'll put, um, we'll put ads in the magazine, we'll put it out through Twitter. We, there's a number of different ways you can collect um, information and it, and it varies and uh, our research director is uh, kind of the expert on that. And the truth of the matter is, is that for your own individual audience, one way might be better than the other. You know, you guys know how your readers might respond in particular. Um, but what we wanted to get was a pool of, of our readers that we could send out a questionnaire to. And we asked them a number of different questions. We included imagery of um, potential covers, asking them uh, what they thought of different types of covers. We would send them covers that were just uh, um, hikers that were, sm or climbers that were small. Um, where they were just kind of part of the scenery. We had them look at imagery of uh, climbers where they were the main focus, um, you know, imagery where it could be just gear. We tried to come up with types of imagery that uh, could connect to the readers to, to get their opinion on, on what they were drawn to. 
We also had um, a section of the, the survey that talked about what would be the perfect magazine for them in broad strokes. Um, we might ask them types of, uh, we call them buckets, but subjects that they might be interested. How interested on a scale of uh, one to five are you in um, gear reviews? How interested are you on a scale of one to five on um, finding local crags near you? How interested are you in uh, international travel? How interested are you in um, profiles on climbing celebrities? What we were trying to get is what, what is it that drives the passion that these readers have for the magazine and what can we do better, okay? Um, one of the questions that I always think is really fascinating and I put it here, I, want, I don't want to set off the feedback, but um, we'd ask them, what is your perfect magazine? And we'll give them opportunities to um, kind of break it out by percentages and it would be 20% gear and 50% international travel and um, We'd, we'd allow them to, to do that. We also, and this is, this is a little simpler way of, of doing it, is we came up with different um, kind of statements of what the magazine could be. So it could say, uh, a magazine for the photo, uh, photos and stories from the most exotic and ex existing climbing venues on Earth. And that could be something that d is the d description, kind of a, a mission statement, as you will. Um, so we gave them a bunch of that. And actually the one that kind of connected to the readers was, and by a very large margin, was um, a magazine for climbers from beginners to experts with the weekend and lifeless destinations. Information on the latest field tested gear, adventure, survival stories, and expert tips on, on um, movement anchors and other skills. Now, a magazine like that is pretty different than a magazine about photos and stories from the most excited, excite, exciting climbing venues on Earth. Because if we were doing something just on the most, climbing, the most exotic climbing venues on Earth, that sounds like a pretty big photo-driven package covering the entire, you know, locations internationally. Whereas what they picked was something that was a little more uh, about skills, with some destination, with some survival stories. They wanted a little more of a mix. So we send out these questionnaires and start getting the, the data back. One thing that came back is that um, we wanted the magazine to, to have a little more energy, um, to reflect uh, the, the style of um, the sport. It's a very dynamic sport. It's very exciting. The photography is, um, is very bold and, uh, and, and the magazine at that moment in this state felt um, very heavy as far as dense with copy. The photography was much smaller um, and we, we felt like it needed a little bit more energy. So we started playing and we started using this idea, just starting with the covers, bigger lines, um, putting it on, you know, it's axi on the type on, on an angle to, to sense motion. Um, we still wanted to play up destination versus bold. They, they'd said that they liked both of those, so we kept moving forward with that. We created sections that the guide, which is, um, we picked one topic each, month, each uh, issue to, to really go in depth on. Because what they were asking for was all these different things, skills and um, destinations and gear. So what we wanted to do is take that and really delve deep into one topic each month. Um, this one happened to be on Galen Rao, the, the great climber and photographer. So it was a great opportunity to really also play up um, a big advantage that um, readers felt we had, which was um, great imagery. This is our route section. Um, again, they, they wanted destinations. They wanted places to go. And so we created a section um, that had, that directly went to write what they, what they said. You know, we're, we're not trying to 
be too clever about it. it it's, you know, they want destinations. We, correct, <laughs> we created something called routes. And what we want to do is play up the photography, give the design a, a sense of motion and energy um, so that they, they could really feel how dynamic the sport is. The other thing that you caught at the end of that, and, and that, was, that was a summary statement. You know, it was backed up by actually what we've also got in other pieces of data, all of this. But another thing that um, they wanted was the skills. And our publisher also, and this is where kind of the balancing act, because you want to do what the readers are asking, and you want to create a magazine that specifically addresses them, but there's also ad configurations and ad situations that, uh, that you have to take in con you know, into account. Um, and one of the things that we, we discussed was, is there a way we can create a section in the back of the magazine that was um, kind of like the equivalent of must-see TV? Like something that's going to drive you back there and, um, and really pull you into the back of the magazine to give ad opportunities. Um, and also because for so many magazines, I think that the back kind of starts to peter out. And then you got the last page and you're done. You know, the, the, the magazine um, gets going, it's really strong, you move into the feature well, it's great feature well, and then you've got your marketplace and da 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 and fractional ads and it's done. So what we were like is, is it, we, can we create something that's going to drive the readers to the back of the magazine? And so we thought that was a great opportunity for our skills section. But as most of us know, um, the back of the magazine is also where the marketplace is and the real estate or whatever your magazine has. And that's very busy and it has, there's a lot there and it's a lot of fractionals or, or um, run over type, you know, for jump from stories. So we had to have this section be really bold. And so, um, so Brian uh, Nanista, our was senior art director in, in the outdoor group, had this idea, well, I, I just want to make it just colorful. I'm just going to throw a bunch of color on there. Just, that, just, you can't miss it. It's like putting up a big uh, uh, flashlight, you know, a big, uh, big yield sign. And so we, put, we created these pages that have um, this big, bold color. We kept the the art to really straightforward diagrams. You know, we wanted this to feel very how-to. We wanted, we wanted the reader to come here and know exactly what they were getting. Oh, this is the, the, this is the know section. This is how I learn This I want to learn a knot. This is where I go. Um, if, I, if, if they, if they want to just find the skill section right away, and they just go to the back of the magazine. And we started in, in the back and moved forward. And it also gave sponsorship ad opportunities for our advertising um, because we created these special fractionals um, that would allow advertisers to have kind of a premium space, but yet it was in the back of the magazine. We already knew that people were interested in buying ads in the front of the magazine, and we were going to continue to try to get that. But what we wanted is, well, can we get somebody to want the back of the magazine? Um, because that's where we have the hardest time. So this was an opportunity to also create that. So that was climbing. So this past year, um, we moved our home group out to Boulder. And one of the first tasks that, um, that myself and the editors of um, some of the magazines were due was to to look at Old House Journal, and this is a magazine that um, is 40 years old. It's uh, it's about home restoration, the appreciation, the preservation of um, old homes, and uh, it it was a big challenge to try to think through this magazine, not only because we were creating something that people were extremely passionate about, um, but also because there was also another magazine called Old House Interiors, and we were merging them. 
Um, it was deemed that this was the best opportunity for both magazines, that the um, audience was relatively, um, was not relatively, when we, when we did research, they were actually very similar. Um, and this gave us more opportunity to grow um, the brand. But that's always a challenge, too, because you're merging two brands. And um, just so that I can give you a quick uh, demographics on the readership of this of, of these magazines, um, the average age was in their 50s, um, generally affluent, um, you know. Um, they define themselves as old house enthusiasts, restoration-minded, historic restor uh, re renovation-minded, and uh, when they can, they like to do the projects themselves. Um, they're really into period correctness and getting it right. 80% um, of the audience live in an old home. Um, and 55% of them have restored two or more old homes. 40% have restored three or more. So it's a group that um, we like to call serial restorers. They, they're passionate about it. They love their projects. They love creating it. It's, it's, it's something that they feel like they're not just doing for themselves, but for um, you know, kind of our culture. And, and they're passionate about the homes. And they generally, when they're done, they're looking for their next project. And so it's, it's in that way, it's a great. 96% of them are going to tackle a major project in the next 12 months. So this is a group that. Um, has a lot. Now, the difference between the two magazines was that Old House Interior generally focused on a lot of the aesthetics, um, picking the right paint, um, the appropriate uh, type of bed to put in your colonial revival home, or um, how to get the right, uh, pick the right wallpaper or molding, or, um, whereas Old House Journal was the gritty side of the process where it's like, get your hands dirty, we're going to rebuild the porch, or we're going to um, do structural um, repairs. And so you have this very aesthetic side with this very um, like DIY side. And this was, this was a big challenge, is we're really, even though the readers were the same, they definitely had these distinct um, differences as we were learning about them. So this is the Old House Journal. And um, we took it upon ourselves that, as our publisher said, we want to get the, uh, the pretty with the gritty, is how he always liked to. Uh, to, to say, so we wanted to figure out a way where we could um, create a magazine that expressed these core values that these readers have and be able to mix um, the big, beautiful uh, features that have home tours and you're, you're going through a home and you're learning about all the beautiful things that they've done and, and basically showcase an old home, but also giving projects that, um, that people can do on a very ground level. So as we were bantering this around, and we were, we were keying in on words that the readers described um, and why they came to the magazine, there were several things that we kind of keyed in on. And um, for lack of a better word, it was ins they, they come to the magazine to be inspired. Um, they come to the magazine to learn how to um, do restoration. And they come to the magazine to learn how to design. Because they want to be period correct. They don't just want to restore the structure. They also want all the furnishings to be um, correct as well, if, even if it's a mid-century modern or it's a, um, a bungalow, uh, arts and crafts bungalow. So there's these three categories that they had. And we kept bantering around to different structures and different ways we could do the magazine um, to focus in on this. And um, what we ended up deciding is that these three kind of topics to inspire, to restore, and to design really were three independent ideas. And so what we ended up doing was creating a magazine that had three sections. It didn't have your traditional feature well and front of book and back of book. It had the inspired section, the restore section, and the design section. So we have our Inspire, where in each of these sections we'll have a feature and then we'll have departments that actually go to, um, to address that. So our Inspired section will be our, our beautiful home tours, um, 
you know, really large photography, uh, really being able to um, express and celebrate the beauty of old homes. Second section is the restore. This is where the nitty gritty, the, the how to, this is like I'm going out and I'm gonna learn everything there is to know about vintage toilets. <laughs> and, uh, or I'm gonna learn how to um, install crown molding or what's the best way to paint my home in period correct uh, colors. And the third section is design. So how do I create a kitchen that is, um, fits my home? Or how do I uh, furnish it? How, where do I go to find, you know, one issue that a lot of these readers have is they want period correct uh, light fixtures or um, side tables, but these things are not necessarily easy to find. So they wanna go somewhere where that kind of information, that kind of product information is available and so that's where we're able to um, give our design section. So we would go from our design opener into our design feature and this was something we ran on um, our uh, this 1940s uh, period kitchen. And the feature we always want to have um, a little fun with, play up the photography because we wanted to have a distinction between where the feature was in the section and where the departments were. Um, we always wanted to go opener, feature, departments, opener, feature, departments. Um, because it is a non-traditional structure that we're creating here. We, we didn't want to confuse people in how the magazine was, um, was built. And so we have these openers to really guide you through. I mean, the, 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 after the TSC, we have the editor's note, and then we go straight into the inspired section. And this is like, this is one department, this is vintage vision from our design. So this is where we'll take an archival photo um, from uh, an old magazine or an old archive. This is 1951 Better Homes and Garden. And then we'll tell you how to find um, products to help that would go with this. So we're helping you get period correct product and also we're telling you where to go. So this is, um, again, we're trying to play up the photography, make it bigger. Um, one of the things that we learned is that the feeling was is that our audience is very visual. They, they, they love their homes, it's a very aesthetic um, experience for them and the magazine up until that point <laughs> Um, didn't take advantage of that. So we were trying to make it a much more visual, less um, dense magazine, but also at the same time giving them the service that they're looking for. Um, this is our key detail. So we'll go into a key um, architectural detail that um, this is the decorated staircase and we'll call out certain points. Again, we're able to use a large photo um, giving people information that can drive them and, and educate them um, as well, but still giving them that visceral aesthetic experience and uh, pulling them into this world that they, they so passionately love. Another way, I should mention, another way we distinguish the sections is we created this icon system, and I know different people have different ideas about icons, but it allowed for a really cohesive um, navigation throughout the entire magazine um, in between the three sections so that it was very clear the moment you opened up the magazine, no matter what page you fell into, you knew where you were. Um, this is our field tested section. This was something new for the magazine. Um, we do a lot of product testing with a lot of our magazines. We're very rigorous about that. Um, and a number of our magazines are really known for the fact that we test our products and um, our reviews are based off of that, not just of, um, you know, just kind of a whim. And one thing that we instituted because our readers, we realized that they really wanted authoritative, um, you know, information from us and they looked at us as the experts is we wanted to create a tester system for um, Old House Journal. 
And so each month we test different tools. Uh, it could be a router, it could be uh, jack planes, it could be um, uh, circular saws, uh, power screwdrivers, um, anything that could be used in the, in the process of restoration. Um, we do head to head with them. And then we also, because we didn't want to just give them product, we also were teaching them how to use the tool. And then we were giving expert advice from one of the, the, the readers. Now, the other reason we love the fact that we're giving expert advice is because these experts become part of the community. They've, they become what the readers know and can go back to. These are people that become part of um, the face of the magazine if, when, as we use them more and more. And um, that um, builds that relationship. One of our magazines um, on the timber side, uh, Log Home Living, uh, its know-how section is actually called um, Log Home University. And we name that because there's a, it, we have an event series at trade shows where people are so passionate about log homes. They're so um, excited and, and dreaming about building log homes that they, they'll pay to come f and s uh, to a room like this and sit um, for five hours listening to um, our very entertaining uh, uh, sales director who's also an expert on log homes. Um, and he teaches them from the very beginning dream stages to the purchase and what you have to do and the financing and all this. And um, it's called Log Home University. So we wanted to cross brand that and the teaching aspect of, of this event series with the teaching aspect of the magazine. So these are opportunities to cross between and, and create not just a print product for our, our magazine or for our readers, but an entire um, world for them, an entire um, experience, whether they're going to the show and learning in our seminars or they're reading in the magazine, um, we're, we're supplying the information in whatever capacity um, makes the most sense. And as, as, you know, as designers and as editors, publishers, we should all be th thinking about that. What is, what is it that we want to, to give our readers and convey to our readers? Um, and what is the best uh, avenue to do that? whether it's the website, whether it's an app, whether it's digital edition, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Twitter. Um, there's so many opportunities in this world now to connect to our readers that we need to be able to, to take advantage of that. So again, this is our quick makeovers. We give you something that you can do in an hour, something you can do in a day, something you can do in a weekend. Again, we're trying to um, give you serviceable information that, that you can act upon right now at a variety of different levels so that if you're an expert and you have more time, you can take on one project. And if you don't, then we still have something for you. Now this is a feature, this would be what we would consider a, a, a home tour um, going into um, the inspired section. And again, we're hearkening to the, the beauty and the history of the magazine in the, in the subject matter, um, really playing that up, giving people the chance to really enjoy uh, and be excited about um, this world. But at the same time, we're still trying to give information because we don't want to just fluff over that, you know. And, but it could be on a variety of different subjects. Here, you know, we had this uh, particular home had an, a beautiful wingback chair, and we gave you the history of the wingback chair. You know, it's small, it's unobtrusive. We still are able to run um, nice large photos, but we're we're adding on to the to the levels of information that we can we can give the readers. All right, so you're going, oh man, you're gonna talk about that magazine? I don't think that looks very good. Do I, should I tell him? No, don't tell me. <laughs> um, this, is, this is OR Daily. This is um, the daily magazine for outdoor retail, which is the largest outdoor trade show for the outdoor industry um, in the United States. It, it happens um, twice a year in January and in August. Um, People come from all over the world. Companies come from all over the world. It happens in Salt Lake City. Um, and uh, about four years ago, we were uh, tasked 
with um, basically recreating their magazine. They, we publish a daily magazine. The show is four days, so four magazines. Um, again, I get to be in a room kind of like this with fold-out chairs for 12 hours a day. And uh, one, of, one of my art directors comes with me. We have a lot of fun. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's a whirlwind. It's kind of a great change of pace from the monthly, uh, the monthly kind of routine. So uh, my boss drops me a copy of this on, on my desk and says, OK, we're going we're gonna to do this, but we got to make it better. And the nice thing about this project was that we have a controlled audience. It's, um, it's industry insiders. It's, it's companies. This isn't even a show that's um, open to the general public. Uh, so we have a long history with this particular audience, especially because of the fact that we publish Backpacker, we publish Climbing, we publish a series in National Park Journals, um, and we run um, this a website called Snooze that um, is kind of the go-to news source for the outdoor industry as well. So we have a good gauge on this audience from the starting point. But in a lot of ways, we all do about our audience. What made it great here was that we had actual access to them while we were publishing. Because the fact is, is that we could publish a day, and then our sales reps for the other magazine, they're having meetings with people, and we can get feedback. We, can, we, can, we know almost instantly if what we're doing is, is, is working or not. And one of the big goals that we wanted to do was um, they asked for product trends. They wanted to know about um, people that were there, happenings that are going on through companies. That could be company-sponsored athletes. This is, um, this is an athlete um, that's, that was at the show just uh, in January. And they also want to know about the parties, um, because you know when you go to a trade show, you want to have a good time, too, I guess. Um, so there's a number of concerts, and you know, I, I, I think last, maybe it was last summer, one of the companies had a bucking bowl that was there, and they'll have a climbing wall, and there's a lot going on beyond even this the trade. So these are the things that we were tasked to do. And they wanted, they wanted a more professional magazine. This was a trade group. You know, this is an industry. Um, and there was the feeling that the magazine um, didn't reflect the level of professionalism that uh, that we were striving for. Now, that can be a challenge when you're inside a uh, convention center, um, everybody's running around, they don't have a lot of time, you don't necessarily have professional setups, uh, someone's not going to necessarily take uh, 45 minutes out of their day to be photographed. Um, so we had to come up with a solution to that. And what we ended up doing is creating our own photo studio just out in the hallway. Um, it, was, it was a lot of fun because it, it, well, we still do it. It's, it's a lot of fun because people are walking by. It's, it's, inter it's actually interacting with the audience. They see that, man, these guys are producing this right here, right now. Um, because there is a feeling in some of these trade show dailies um, that, oh, it's kind of all canned content that there's only a couple pages that are actually like on site, ready to go. Um, a lot of it's just already done, and they just put it together and press releases, and then they ship it out each day. So we really wanted to get, allow readers to experience that, no, we're producing this right now. Um, this is happening. Um, and by doing that, by getting out in, into the space, they actually witness that, which is exciting. So this is, the, this is already, this is what we developed. Um, as far as covers go, uh, that went from that to this. Um, we wanted to have more control of the, of the product. So that was the other reason that we, allowed, we were allowed to, to have the photos 
studio, it gave us control over our subjects. We can ask somebody really quickly for 10 minutes to come over. We can have the lighting all set up. They can just come from their trade booth, stand in for a five minute shoot, and then go back to business. This gave us a tremendous amount of um, control and consistency for the brand. So it, it allowed it, um, you know, we gave really strong branding and uh, it gave a consistent look for the magazine. So these are a couple other covers. Uh, it ranges from you know, actual trade stuff. They have concerts. So this is Michael Franti. Um, some of you guys might know him, maybe not, um, who's a, a singer who would put on a concert that was sp sponsored by Wolverine Boots. So he, w he came over and we shot him. Um, we were doing a story on the outdoor industry and gear and its connection to the military and how military is a big um, client for the outdoor industry to get, you know, and their needs. And so we, we had a story on that. We wanted it to still feel news oriented, so we didn't do the full bleed. We kept it so we could do small news one offs uh, either down the side or down the front. Because we were, for us in this particular project, we were really projecting um, the idea of um, authoritative um, news gathering, and yet in a fun, energetic spirit. Because that's really kind of the tone of the show. We could take outtakes for um, the TOC. Um, that's Aaron Ralston, who some of you might know who he is. Um, uh, he was caught in the Southwest, had to cut his arm off um, to survive. And this is Bear Grylls, who's been on TV, survivalist. So we had some fun with him. Um, and this was a case where we didn't have a lot of time, but what we did have is we, we shot five minutes of his time, and then we went and got the knives and shot the knives um, separately and were able to quickly put it together. Gear, it's, it's the most important thing about this. The trends, um, this is what they want as far as when they come in the show, they wanna say, well, what do I need to know? And so we put a, a heavy emphasis on that. Uh, we really wanted it to visually um, have a tone that this is important, this is what we're, we're doing, and this is how um, you're going to learn about everything we know. These are the trends. Did you have a question? So that's a really good question. What we end up doing is um, some stuff we have to shoot at the show if, if we're discovering things really quickly. But in order to facilitate, because it, I mean, the amount of product that's at a show like this, um, we've set up a database that people submit their products to us so that we have, and there's no guarantee that your product will be in the magazine um, per se, uh, but what we have is control. We have, we have all this product, and if somebody discovers something about it, we, we probably already have it. The other thing about it is most of these companies all have product shot and they've kind of become savvy enough to know it's pretty smart to have their product on a, on a thumb drive because we might come ask them for it and if it's in the right format and shot on white then there's a good chance that we might grab it. Right, so there's a lot of planning that goes into it about you know, leading up to the show. Um, some of the stuff is already known, some of the interviews um, that we want to cover because um, the, the main editors that are involved in it are our snooze editors and so they cover the industry. They already kind of are starting to see the trends. They, they go into the show with a pretty good knowledge of kind of what the highlights are gonna be and what we're looking for is the stuff that you know, nobody knew about quite yet, or to fill in gaps or to start, um, you know, we ha we'll send out our, our, our writers and say like, okay, these are the stories you're covering, you know, whether it's um, Mark Udall, who's a senator from Colorado who's been very ill, he might be at the show and he's giving a talk, and so we'll send one of our writers to cover that. But then at the same time, we also know, okay, this person is going to be there. We want to interview them. So we're prepared. We're prepping for all of this 
beforehand. So there's, there is that sense of you know, breaking news. There's the stuff that we kind of already start to see the trends and we're you know, kind of confirming. And then there's the stuff that we know and people are gonna wanna know. Um, and we're, pre we're prepping those pages even beforehand just because um, where people want to eat is not, I don't, we don't need to design that one at the show. It's like we have the map, we know where the restaurants are. So we'll, we'll, we'll lay that out and we'll get some of these other pages. Um, because it would be, there's only two designers at the show. So it would be impossible to, to lay out this entire magazine all at once. And the printers can't handle it to do overnight because of the fact that it's a smaller run, we have to go with smaller printers. And this is how a lot of trade shows go. So we actually, there are some like stock kind of stuff um, that we'll pre-print um, beforehand. So how quick is the turnaround from first day of the conference to April 29th? Next day. Wow. So um, uh, we'll show up that morning. Um, we'll start anywhere around 8 a.m. And the writers are already out covering, you know, there's a breakfast or there's some event going on, somebody's having a demo of some new, uh, you know, product. So they're out covering stories. Um, our photographers, we have two photographers that are there. They'll be out covering specific events that, we, you know, that couldn't be supplied by somebody or that, um, you know, there was a concert or there was uh, a breakfast where somebody important was at or, you know, those types of events. Um, so they'll all be out. About 10 o'clock, people start to come back, start bringing in their stories. They're working on it. Um, Brian and I are already working on stuff like the TOC or uh, there's a page, uh, this page here, which is editor's picks. They're out on the show floor finding new cool things that we just want to, they, they necessarily haven't been tested, but we're like, hey, this is really interesting. You should go check it out. You know, it's, and so, we might have a number of them, like I might have gotten too many the day before, so I have some leftovers. So I'll start to get that page going because um, we actually map it out on the show floor. I can, I'm not sure if you guys can see this, but um, we have a map of the show floor. We'll tell you where it is on the show floor, where the booth is. Um, it's just a little more graphic way of, of doing this. Um, and so, you know, by 10 o'clock, by noon, one o'clock, the stories are starting to, to roll in. And um, we generally are shipping to the printer around seven. And so it's, it's a relatively fast turnaround. We might have a cover shoot that day. If we can get, if we know who we want to be the cover on day four and they're available on day two, we might get them for that. But then some days, like the concerts, the, the people who are getting shot, like uh, Michael Franti or, um, this last show, uh, Capital Cities, um, was there, and like we had 10 minutes to shoot them. You know, they're just coming in, they're getting the shot, and then they're off to the venue to. So it, we might have one of those shoots. We might need to shoot a product. It, it kind of varies up each day, but yeah, it's a busy. It's pretty busy to say the least. Um, photography. This was a big part of what we wanted to do and create is, is balance the, the, the heavy product, you know, um, you know, product on white, business, commerce, which is the main part of the show. But there's a personality to the show that also is really important to the outdoor industry. It, it's who they are. And, you know, they have this, um, what they call on mountain demo. Um, the first day we're um, up in Park City, they'll, they'll actually, you can go up there and test out different gear and it's, it's a very loose environment and fun and kids are there, you know, this was, um, they were playing with this product and so we're trying to capture that. They had a climbing competition um, last summer, um, so we sent one of our photographers to, to shoot that and uh, so he, he got this image um, where he shot uh, the entire process and this was a I think it was a 50 foot wall I can't remember the exact height and then when they fell they fell into the swimming pool um, so it was a pretty exciting event and made for some really great photography but it just captured the spirit 
Um, the nightlife is rather um, big, and people end up doing some funny things. This was the Capital Cities concert. They got people up on stage, and they were all dancing around. And um, this was a party that uh, Teva puts on every year where they'll have a band, and people dress up. And it, there's just the lifestyle of this. There's a, there's a kind of a character and feel, and we wanted to capture that as well. Um, through because it, it it is about commerce, but it's it's so much more than that. It's about people and uh, that kind of connection to uh, that. So a couple things to 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 wrap up. There was you know we talked a lot about different types of you know big surveys and um, getting readers groups together and get emails and these are these are big things sometimes you need a research director or, you know but there's other ways to gather reader feedback um, you know uh, Facebook a friend of mine who is design director at Houstonia it's the new city magazine of Houston. Um, he, they don't have a huge research budget, they don't, but he brought up a really great point. He follows Twitter and Facebook very carefully just to see what people are saying about the magazine. The magazine, they started from scratch, and the truth of the matter is Houston doesn't have a real history with city magazines. So this is kind of a new venture in a lot of ways for the, the city. And so they'll follow, um, he, he'll follow and get input on different stories and, and engage in readers that way. Um, Huffington Magazine, it's a digital magazine. It's based off of the, um, from uh, Huffington. And it's, a, it's an incredible digital product that they have. And um, I was talking to uh, the head of, of their magazine and he, this magazine has in Apple a four and a half star rating. Like they, they're getting feedback from their readers through iTunes that they're doing something right. So this is an opportunity that they have. Um, you know, they don't have to grab a big, huge survey group or they don't have to, um, because their readers are giving them feedback directly onto iTunes. And for him, it's great because he takes the research money and he uses it for more innovative features. You know, these are just reader comments, but he follows it. You know, they come out, um, you know, uh, on a frequent basis, and you know, it's almost weekly. And so readers are engaging them through iTunes. And you know, I know that all of us have different levels of reader interface through um, different medium or different, you know, whether it's Facebook or whether it's our websites. Or, and we have to take into consideration what medium they're coming through. Not everybody has a direct correlation of a digital magazine getting feedback through iTunes, but whenever we can find other outlets where people are just volunteering their, their information, then that's something that uh, is a real advantage for us. Three by five cards. This is another thing, that, uh, very low tech. Um, I, I've been working with uh, a, um, an institutional magazine uh, for uh, educational uh, with an institution, and they have a lot of access to their readership through events, through different types of outlets. And one thing they did was pass out three by five cards and ask the readers to write down words that connect to their, how they feel about this institution or that describe this institution. You know, keywords, words like quirky, authoritative, um, educational, um, uh, journalism, because that's one of the, the prominent uh, programs. You know, whatever they saw, bright, happy, um, and collecting them over large databases you know, large sample size as they were just, you know, everybody had three by five cards, everybody that just worked, they were just passing them out. And this is an opportunity that they had to just connect directly to the reader um, that they were uh, engaging and just very quickly, it didn't take the reader a lot of time, it didn't take the audience a lot of time, they just asked them to write down a couple words, but then they, they were able to aggregate this and really get a feel of what their audience thought of their subject, which happened to be um, an educational institution. And this was just kind of a very easy um, way of collecting, you know, really on the ground 
um, feelings about their product. So this is um, my Twitter. If anybody has questions or anybody who's watching on the webcast, feel free to, uh, to ask me uh, questions or uh, give me feedback or uh, connect with me. Um, I definitely have some time to uh, have any questions if anybody does. I wanted to leave some time at the end for that. Absolutely. So I'm supposed to repeat the question <laughs> it, as it was asked. What do you do to keep inspired over time? Like, you must be so busy. How do you keep the time? Um, so the question was, what do I do to keep inspired and f feel like I'm fresh with the design? I think for me um, personally, the I get to work on a lot of different projects. Um, I, and they could all be in the same day. Uh, in the morning, I could be working on an ebook for the outdoor group on survival tales. Um, about noontime, I could be working on uh, a feature for Old House Journal. And then uh, a couple hours later, I could be in discussions on the website for uh, log home living or climbing. And at the end of the day, having a, a planning meeting for the daily. Now, that might be a little bit, but that's, that's kind of the idea. Um, I get to be involved in a lot of, I get to work with a lot of great people. There's, um, my staff, there's 10 of us that work between the two groups. So like I said, I, we put out 100 issues in a year, but that's split between two teams that I have working on different projects. Now we do another 40 digital editions, 40 to 50, and marketing material, and it's, it's ongoing. We're always busy for sure, but, um, the, the idea that we get to create new things all the time. And I'm constantly looking. I'm inspired by what I see around me. And I mean, that's kind of cliche, but um, especially what magazines are happening right now. You know, there's just some really great um, design out there that um, is really inspiring. And, and I'm not just talking about the amazing work that maybe GQ or Bloomberg Business Week or Wire. Like, there's a lot of great smaller titles that are doing. I think we all, I, there was a great example yesterday with the uppercase um, you know, presentation. There's just some really, really cool work and um, that just helps us. And I think with digital too, that's such a new field that we all get to partake in somehow. And even if your magazine doesn't do a digital edition or doesn't have a website, these are things that we're all moving towards. So we should care about them. And it's an exciting time to be an art director. So those are, those are, that's kind of how I keep going. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, what are some design missteps you've made and what did you learn from them? OK. Um, a lot. <laughs> I think that uh, sometimes that, you know, reader research is really valuable, but we also have to figure out how to make that work within the, the frame of what we have. And sometimes we can uh, bite off a little more than we can chew. And a big thing, and I was talking to some people about this at lunch, that, you know, and, and I know I've made this mistake of, of where we, we didn't focus on like just a couple things that we can do really well. You know, we got to do the, this and this and this and this and this. So we try to do everything instead of doing two things super well to connect to our readers. And I think that that, that has been something that I've learned over time is that if do what your resources allow you to do. And that means you might not be able to do everything but the things that you decide to do, do them super well.